Excellent. Thank you. Can folks hear me? Get a thumbs up from Thomas at least? Okay, good. Um, still a little discombobulated by the two videos thing, but I'll get it going. And please, if uh, I miss something, just let me know and I'll slow down and back up. So uh, yeah, really glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for the invitation and the, the great intro. Um, I've got several years of working remotely under my belt. So it was really interesting a couple of years ago when it became sort of a standard for folks to have different experience about it. Uh, I've done it before it was required. And so it's I've learned a little bit about how to, to fit in with teams that are mostly remote or mostly in person. And I like to experiment and be playful with how I work. So I'm hoping to share some of that with folks and hopefully y'all can learn to enjoy working remotely and feel effective, especially in a solidist context, which I will get to that bit towards the end, mostly going to be talking about generic advice on working remotely. So uh, y'all can still see my, see my screen here, right? Terminal with the uh, nail the demo. Yeah, all right. I see it and gather. So uh, yeah, been working remotely. Uh, so yeah, I think I worked remotely for a year with Rails Dog and then off and on for a couple of years with some jobs in Memphis. And then the last oh, three or four years straight working remote for companies in different states. Um, I like to have fun with work, like the code I write and the meetings I participate in are all very entertaining. Otherwise, I just can't stay engaged. Like I'm not, I don't manage to be a comedian all the time, but I do give myself permission to enjoy work, like whether it's wearing a silly shirt or naming my classes or something that uh, maybe is not super serious, right? So I do that a lot. And um, I gotta say in the last year or so, I've really started experimenting with my home working environment, gotten really into improving the situation and trying out different things to see how they can make the experience more fun whether it's just a regular video meeting like this or a, a co-working pair programming session with a teammate or a real customer demo. And uh, I'll try to show you all a lot of what I've got going on there. Um, so yeah, let's just jump into the remote work bits, the more technical things that are not gonna be huge surprises, but are still fun. Uh, AV quality is a big deal for me. I've gotten more and more into that in the last year or two. Uh, one thing that's been nice for me in the last two, two years, I've had the opportunity to work from my own private room. Like uh, we have a, I guess, property values in Florida are pretty affordable. So there's a whole extra room for me to do my work. My first year of remote work with Rails Dog, I was using a 13 inch hand-me-down laptop running, uh, sitting on the kitchen table for a whole year. And so I did a lot of alt having. I got a good bit of work done, but it was it was hard, right? Uh, now I have this space that I can better personalize and customize. Like you can see behind me, there's art, mirrors, a map of art. Uh, there's a, a medal from a jiu-jitsu tournament, which I'll get to that later and how jiu-jitsu informs my preparation for demos. So uh, let's see, whiteboarding and IDE sharing are big parts of day-to-day -day teamwork, things we do online with each other. Um, just to jump into some entertaining uh, diversions, I'm gonna show you some stuff in Finder. And I've got two videos I made this morning. Uh, it will take me a second to get the audio lined up, but might be able to just adjust the screen sharing option. So here's a preview of where I'm going in a minute with uh, audio capture. I'm going to turn off my microphone and just play this first video. And when it's done, I'll chatter a bit and we'll move on to the next one. So this is me demonstrating, like, why not dial in from outside, right? One of the great things about having your own space is you can work from a treadmill desk or work from the backyard or sometimes sit on the porch when the weather's nice. And uh, I've taken a call from the pool, but I didn't tell anybody. Uh, I take calls walking around the neighborhood just when I need to stretch my legs. So here's a quick video. 
Hey, let's take a call from the backyard. It's uh, a nice 50 degrees out here. Should be good to get some sunshine instead of just being online all day. Ah, yes. So here we are taking a call from the backyard, enjoying the swing, sitting in the tree. Good times, right? Good times. All right, so before I go into the next video, I mean, that's just, that's something I like to do, right? If I have a, a regular staff meeting, like a one-on-one -on -one with my boss, it's pretty easy just to say, hey, I felt like dialing in from away from the desk. I'm just going to keep the video off and chatter. And sometimes they want to see the video, but this is a nice thing to be able to do when you have the chance. Uh, so before I get into the next video, I want to skip ahead a bit to something that I hope to delay a bit, but it turns out I can't uh, bring myself to. Uh, there's a lot you can do with a home setup to improve your video and audio quality with lighting, cameras, microphones. I probably invested more than necessary on that in the last year, but uh, so don't take all this as strong recommendations. But uh, first off, let's switch from my built-in camera or microphone on this uh, monitor I got from work to one I picked out myself that I rather like. So still me, same person, same voice, but sounds like I'm on the radio now. It took a lot of research and money, but it's fun, right? Uh, I feel like this helps me to bond and really have a better experience with coworkers and customers. Like it's good for meeting people and making friends or even doing sales stuff like interviews or trying to pitch somebody on uh, my services. And I don't know, now I've got something updating in the background that I've never even used. But so we're going to move from the camera, or sorry, from the microphone to the camera. Let me see what I've got to make a better camera happen here. I'm actually on both Gather Town and Zoom. So let's switch to both, switch the camera in both. Uh, using something called CamLink 4K. So now I have a little HDMI dongle that takes an input from any camera that spits out HDMI and then provides it magic drivers to use it as a webcam in Windows or Mac OS. I'm on a Mac right now. So you can see right away that the video quality is a lot clearer. I can mess around with the zoom sometimes depending on how I'm feeling. Like if I wanted to show off something in particular, like here's the map of Florida. I live in the top left where the three trees are. So this is all fun, but again, not necessarily a critical experience, but fun. And uh, finally, once I got the camera and the microphone, I realized there was still something missing with my lighting setup. Uh, so I've got nice light coming in from the window and sometimes I do it like this and you can actually see me better with the light coming in. That natural light there. But it's still not great because half of me is in the dark and it's kind of like a weird creepy confessional video. So I've got all the room lights wired up through a, a Wi-Fi bridge that lets me control them remotely. But most importantly, I've asked my dad who was in a AV production decades ago for advice on key lights. And now this is my everyday setup. I have a big key light right there that's somewhat blinding so I can turn it down when my eyes get tired for a long-term session, but for a, a shorter presentation like this, then I'll go with the big deal, with the, the best video I can, the best lighting and the best microphone. So that really does help to bond with people and help them really understand and be able to focus more on the content and not on the connection trouble. So that said, I've got one more silly video. I've got to find that somewhere. Oh, yeah. Well, I had planned to mention at some point that uh, it's nice to make use of your space. You can walk around the house, use your things in your room for visual aids, introduce your pets. In this case, this guy was getting jealous and wants to hop up in my lap while I'm talking. So I'm just going to show him and put him back down. But this is Cosmo. Say hi, Cosmo. Wolfert's down there, but he's a little harder to pick up. So anyway, we're going to the other video. I will need to. 
tweet the audio one more time. I find my audio manager and then open this video. Other times it's warm outside, so we take the call from the pool. Probably have the video off and don't splash too much because you don't want your coworkers getting jealous. But it's still fun to take a call from the pool, right? So here is, oh, today might not have been the right day for that, but we're having a good time. All right, so that's the only, the second and final video I've got for today. I just felt like some visual aids would be fine there. Uh, it's, you know, it's tolerable in Florida. I don't actually get in the pool after, say, October most years, but still fun to be able to do that. And I did, like I said, take a call from a pool float once, just chatting with a, a coworker about some serious business, and it was a, a nice experience. Um, this is probably way too much for most people, but I have this program I found called Loopback that uh, allows me to toggle through various audio sources. So this is how I've been able to, say, choose microphones or stream in audio from a specific program without having to switch the microphone selections in Zoom or uh, Gather Town. The main reason I got this is my fancy microphone interface only handles a single channel. So I've spent all this money on microphone and then suddenly it's just coming into the left channel because the thing's designed to take two different microphones. And I didn't know that because I'm not a sophisticated audio engineer, but this allows me to split that channel out to two. So my one microphone just plays on both sides. So that's enough for uh, tech demos. Uh, hope that was entertaining for somebody. Um, let's dig into what we've got next. So yeah, we've showed the cameras and the microphones and the lighting. That's all a big part of the experience for me. Um, another thing that I'm gonna try to show, let's see if I can do this on both sides. I can change, okay, I can't show this on Gather Town, but I guess it'll be all right. So I have this device called the stream deck. Well, I'll just take a picture of everything. And the stream deck. So here's just taking a picture and I'm gonna drop them on my screen real quick so y'all can see them too. Under yeah. So here's the first photo. That's not the first photo. There we go. So yeah, this is my desk. These are the two uh, monitors, the camera. The light is right off from the top left here. But right here in the center is something called the Stream Deck. It's a, a programmable button bar. It's basically each one of those buttons is a tiny little LCD screen and you can configure them to do pretty much anything you can imagine with your computer. So for instance, if I open the, if I click on something on the actual button bar, it'll update the app here. So I can click the, turn off the key light button. I can click uh, the hue light button. That's the, the room lights. Um, I messed around with music stuff. I had a sound bar going at some point that may not actually come through for y'all, but let's see. It looks like it's coming through a little bit. I'm not fully bringing in Spotify, but I could be. Yeah, so it's been a while. This program is pretty easy to, there we go. There's the full audio. Now I messed up my audio channels that I was telling them about. And I don't even remember how to fix it. So there we go. Now I've got this stream to both. And stop the music. 
back to the, the button bar demo. Um, it's nice to be able to set up stuff for work. So I work for Rebellion Defense. I've got a, a separate list for a lot of the common apps we use. Like uh, I can open up Google Meet and it just pops open a browser tab. Well, not when I'm in this browser profile, but if I open a foregrounded browser profile for work, then y'all can see yeah, the meet button will open a tab and show my current meetings. And my one-on-one -on -one with my boss is usually at this time, but I delayed it so I could come present here. Uh, a lot of GitLab stuff, Slack. It's pretty comfortable. Um, some of the weird names are running in front of shell scripts where I can put together a bunch of different things at once, like say, turn on the music and turn down the lights and try to pay attention to what I'm doing programming wise. Um, it's probably all that's worth showing with the stream deck, but uh, let me get my video back up so I can see y'all. There we go. Yeah, I can see the conference again. <clears throat> so Stream Deck's cool. Uh, another great thing about having a home office and being able to get at least some equipment paid for by the company, like they sent me a nice MacBook, what was top of the line at the time. I, mean, I guess it's the 2019 Intel. And I eventually got around to wiring up home Ethernet, uh, setting up a uh, network attached storage device with a bunch of hard drives for extra storage, uh, a couple of Raspberry Pis for a Kubernetes cluster. And then I set them all up with a tail scale VPN. So here's the cluster. There's three Raspberry Pis that are <clears throat> each running, they're connected to this cluster. And then here's a much larger, newer machine that I set up a month or two ago that's just a big, beefy, Linux server that I can shell into to, to build things quicker because I'm very much sensitive to speed regarding uh, how long it takes to download something or build something and run a test suite. I, I like writing tests. Uh, a key reason for this is that uh, I have a terrible short-term memory. So anything that I don't script and verify with tests in CI is going to I'll forget it exists a month or a week or a month later and it'll stop working if I don't back it up. So I'm a lot more proactive about testing and CI than a lot of folks. And it's more of a self-defense thing than uh, me having some sort of purist enlightenment going on. No, anyway, so here's the Kubernetes cluster. I'll demo some of that later. Tailscale is a very simple and easy uh, VPN program that you can run on Mac or Windows or Linux that allows you to, and phones for that matter. So I'm running tail scale, let's see. I remember how this works. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's a funny one here. Uh, later I'm gonna demo a way I share my IDE with folks and connect to other machines. I do this with VS Code. Uh, I'm not even gonna demo it, but with VS Code, you can say, I can use the Mac as a thin client for seeing my code, running, writing it, editing it, but uh, actually do all the building, compiling, and Docker management on a remote machine. That blows up whenever I try to connect, if I set my default shell to fish, which I like. So this is my way of splitting the difference. Uh, VS Code is happy, and I will get a regular reminder that I don't actually want to use Bash. So that tail scale on this machine, you can see the machines on the network. This is my big new Linux box. Here are the three uh, little Raspberry Pis. They're all running Ubuntu. And then here's the, the network attached storage. But the cool thing about this is I can open up tail scale on my phone. This is a phone provided by work, but uh, now that I'm on, it may just show up right there, yeah. So yeah, now my phone is being pinged by the, the Linux box in the corner through this VPN system. So you should check out Tailscale if you don't want to use it. It's very useful for, say, sharing things across families or teams or just your own computers. Okay, that's hardware for now. Uh, now back to 
using the space I mentioned before, you know, show off your pets, go get some water. I mean, I have to break, especially when I'm talking like every half hour to get another drink. And then that means bathroom breaks. But uh, if you're going to be given a demo, it's common to have, if, if it's a, an impactful or like I said, especially if it's a big sales demo or something you're stressed out about at work, it helps to do your best to get a good night's sleep. Uh, personally, I slept like two hours last night, but uh, because I was thinking about what to talk about today and uh, it's, you know, that's hard, but at least seeing it coming and drinking water and eating healthy helps. Uh, I do have different chairs. So I'm using a little stool that helps me to sort of maintain good posture and not feel like I'm slouched and my back's broken after six hours at work. I also gotten into, I've never managed to pull off a treadmill desk, which I wanted to, but maybe one day. I do have a little balance board, like basically a skateboard with no wheels on a, a post that I just wobble around on to keep me engaged. That's just enough to keep my core engaged, but also it's sort of like a fidget device. I can actually pay attention and hold the conversation and listen better when I'm doing this because I can't be driving the mouse or really spacing out. So yeah, all of that. I mean, that's great. If you have personal space to work on, go for it. Uh, it's always nice to play with your medium. Something I figured out you could do with Gather Town is to actually check for, or to try to encourage some audience interaction. I would like to know if there's a way I can get people to speak to me and talk back in this conference. Uh, Thomas, I heard you before. Can you speak again so I make sure I can know someone's there? You don't need to unmute first, though. I don't know. I think we lost him. Let's see a few other people here, though. There's Roberto. Or... Oh, it connects when I scroll around. Yep. You're still muted, man. Did I mute you personally? Oh, yeah, there we go. It looks like I must have muted you. There must be like an anti-griefing feature. Like, I don't want to hear from Thomas, even if he's unmuted. I tried to <laughs> unmute you, but instead I just forced muted you on my end. Um, so, hi. Uh, so, yeah, and I agree with what you're saying. It'd be great to have more audience participation. I know that other speakers would feel like that as well. Yeah. And that's actually why I kept my, my camera on. I figured I'd just take a break. So visual feedback. Yeah. And on stage here, if I unmute, you can hear me. Right. I can't hear members of the audience, but all. I just found this button and I mute one at a time. Yeah. I see Roberto and Chris there. That's a nice shark. Is that a, a digital ocean shark or just a shark shark? Okay. I've got a gopher bat there. And uh, anyway, so the one thing I noticed reading up on Gather Town, this is probably my second or third time using it, but it's apparent, supposedly if you press the Z key, your character will dance. So that's a a fun way to just toggle dance off and on. Anybody else? Oh yeah, I see a couple of dancers out there. Excellent. So it's, now I don't know how to undance, but that'll do. Okay, yeah. So it's nice to see that, yeah, that's a way to get people involved. Uh, you know, if you have a, an in-person, whoa, Peter. Hey buddy. All right, coming down up front to dance like you're at a, a festival, this is perfect. So uh, yeah, it's, it's good to do what you can to engage people, um, especially just having a regular work from home conference call, just talking about like, how's your day? What's going on in the room? There was a guy I work with, lives in DC, who's out then wearing a Snuggie, like those big comfy blanket hoodies things. And I said, oh, you look really cozy and I asked what's going on. He said, it's 23 degrees in DC yesterday. So always fun to see that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh the tech i'm using i used to have a logitech c920 i think it's like a 70 dollars 80 dollars camera that provides a really good experience usb built-in uh microphone good light adapt uh, adaptive light so you look pretty good even without a key light so that's that's a step up from the built-in i was showing you all before um i'm currently using this camlink 4k device i mentioned which allows me to hook in like a full-fledged DSLR or actually mirrorless camera. So I've got like a Sony Alpha, which is the sort of thing a lot of streamers use. There's a, long, a large price range on that. But for microphones, 
that can be pretty expensive. Like you can get a, a good thing like a, is it a Blue Yeti for $100 or so? That's a nice USB microphone that'll get you a big step up in sound quality from what people use built into a laptop. I'm using a sort of a broadcaster style microphone, the Electro Voice RE20, and that's run through a, a device that con converts from that XLR analog audio to <clears throat> digital through USB. That stuff costs way too much, but it's fun. And I, I guess I had been, I, I'm hard of hearing, so I've worn hearing aids my whole life. And I, I think I'm a bit more sensitive or self-conscious about my voice and speech than other people. So it makes me feel a little better, right? Just a little bit of extra confidence there helps me to bond with folks and have a good time. Um, there was a camera device or there's a program called Epic Cam that I played with that allows you to use an iPhone as a remote camera through Wi-Fi. So I could like walk around and show you all what's in the room, show you the house. But unfortunately, I can only get to come up on Zoom today and not, uh, not gather. So I'm not going to go into the demo there. But it's pretty cool if you're trying to <clears throat> show somebody something like what's in the front yard or backyard of the next room, it'd be pretty nice. Like say if we're streaming a presentation to a big screen TV in the next room, I could just go show you there. Um, yeah, so this is an opportunity to talk about the way I think about performances. Uh, so Sprezzatura, I haven't taken Latin, not Latin, Italian in about 20 years, but I always liked the idea. It's, uh, it's an ideal that obviously I don't actually get to very often. Um, if you practice something really a whole lot and you master it, then the, the skill and the enjoyment shows. And I sort of, I try to aim for that, like, uh, messing around with my, my lighting buttons and bringing in various props from off camera always makes me feel like I'm giving a, a more engaging and well-considered presentation. Uh, so yeah, ballet stories. My daughter is 14 now. She started ballet in kindergarten and she did it for seven or eight years and they practice for hours every week. They wound up giving huge performances in downtown Memphis at a big theater, the Orpheum in front of hundreds of people for several shows every year. And watching her practice that for years really was instructive to me because I'd never gone beyond say high school plays as a basically an extra in a play, right? But the effort they put into that is really interesting. And there's a lot to it in that you really only get one chance to do it. You can only get so much. So you have to really practice it to hit all your marks. There's a lot of synchronization and choreography. And, um, your audience interaction is somewhat limited, especially if you're in the dark with spotlights on it. You might hear clapping or oohs and ahs, but you're not really getting faces and voices. So it's a useful thing to learn from, but for remote work, this type of interaction, I feel like a comedy club or, or say live music is a more apt analogy. So it's in, in a comedy club, you know, you're going to interact with the people in the front row as a comedian, you're going to, you can, benefit from telling people the truth in a surprising way uh walking around you know having your own props like this is all normal uh something i've realized especially having worked from home for a long time that i notice when other people are new to working from home they tend to be they check in like all the time like hey i'm gonna go to the grocery store for 20 minutes i'll be right back like i found that the less people know about what i'm doing when we're not face to face on a work call the the better we get along and like the, the happier we are and the more mutual respect we have. Not to say that I'm cagey about my personal life. Like I will spill way too many details about what I had for dinner or like my medical maladies. But uh, yeah, people don't really, you don't need to account for every second of your day when you're in a distributed environment. So try not to. Uh, circus is another type of performance that I think about a lot. Um, some of y'all may be familiar with Katrina Owen. She's a Big deal, Ruby presenter. I used to do that a lot years ago. She's behind uh, exorcism.io, a neat code training site. And I remember she was doing podcasts a lot uh, five or 10 years ago, and I was really listening to Ruby podcasts all the time. And she'd uh, talked about how she had, she gave this huge presentation, it was really well received at a conference in Europe. And the first thing she said was that she spent like hundreds of hours on the presentation. And she, really nailed down all the details and got everything perfect. And when I found out that her background was in like a 
post-grad program in biology or some sort of hard science like that. It sort of made sense to me that she's very methodical and detailed. But then later I'm hearing her on a podcast, she's talking about how before she got into sciences, which is what she did before programming, she was actively training to join a circus, like a some sort of clown college. I don't know if it's a clown or not, but you think like Cirque du Soleil stuff, people are doing acrobatics. Like she was doing weightlifting and tumbling and all kinds of cool stuff. And it's just need to take that type of activity and learn from the benefits of dedicated focus practice and the carryover into your regular life. Uh, last couple of years, I've been doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which has been, I like to say it's like the, the perfect antidote to a remote uh, programming job because my job keeps me indoors. I don't get any sunlight, don't get any exercise, don't get human contact, but with jujitsu, I'm wrestling with people. Like I'm actually touching people in a socially acceptable way. Like I'm not bumping into people at the grocery store because I'm lonely. Right. Uh, it's, 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 it keeps me in good shape. It keeps me happy. It, being able to go in the morning before work really keeps me centered. Like y'all may have heard of, I don't know, rec- advice to like do power poses or take a walk or something before you have a big meeting, just so you can get in the right frame of mind. But Jiu-jitsu a few times a week is definitely that for me. And when I can't do it, like in the winter, sometimes it's hard. It's harder for me to stay on top of things. Uh, I have a couple of quick videos. Um, although I might want to go in instead of the videos, I might want to go to straight to my tech demos. Uh, can I get a time check, Thomas? Do you got any advice on what I should aim for here? Yeah, you're, you're doing fine. Uh, just keep going with it. Whatever you want to show. The next thing we have is the stakeholder meeting, but that probably will be short. But we can start that a little bit later. So okay. Do whatever you'd like. All right. So let's say let's say we go for 20 more minutes. Here's another thing that helps me when I'm working remotely: a timer program that also yeah. Between that and this little egg timer, it really helps when you have terrible short-term memory and you forget. Who, who you are and what you're doing here today and how much time you have left. So that sort of thing can really help if you're trying to make the most of your demo time. Um, this is not a very uh, good sport on video. Uh, I'm, I think I'm in, I'm in black. I tend to be longer and clumsier than most of my opponents. So my, my go-to strategy is to sit down before they can knock me down because it helps me. They, they get points for knocking me down and then try to wrap them up and, work my way through various positions so I can get points for taking a dominant position. Like right here, I'm trying to land a triangle, which could be a submission choke, but I don't quite have it. And my coaches right here start to advise me once I almost lose it to go on top, like switch, flip them over to take a regular wrestling style pin. And so I'm going to, yeah, I guess it only takes a couple minutes. Once I get on top, I'll show you the next video where I lose terribly. But uh, I think I'm in an eight-person age group bracket here. So this is 35 to 40-year-old men around 205 pounds last August. So, yeah, this is them telling me to go on top. And eventually I pull it off. I get on top. And the rest of the video is just him trying to get out from under me and me trying not to lose the top position. and. Uh, Time expires and I've got six or eight points because I managed to not screw up too much. But, you know, so that's that's a good thing. And this jujitsu really helps me, especially when I'm losing, which I'll show you all more of the, the loss video. I'm already logged in. Ah, i got to log back in. You're done? Yeah. So this guy... I saw actually on YouTube, he'd won a tournament in Memphis months earlier with very scary skills. So again, he's smaller, shorter and uh, not so clumsy. So I immediately try to sit down and pull him in, like I said before, because I know that I don't have a chance of uh, winning in a stand-up situation. So right now I'm on the ground, but I'm not down by two points. So that's good. And then uh, he's going to pretty quickly pull out of my attempts to slow him down. And he gets past my legs there. So now I'm about to lose. He could pretty easily break an arm or choke me out if I don't recover. So I pushed back in, but it took literally all of my strength to get back. And now at this point, I'm completely exhausted. So he winds up doing the exact same thing, escaping. And I think he wraps me up in some sort of 
collar choke and I tap out. So the lesson here is aside from just exercise being good for you is uh, this gives me a lot of practice with anxiety and perseverance, hard work, that sort of thing. Right. Um, this is not something you can get when you're programming. So I'm better able to put things in perspective at home if I'm being choked out by superior opponents 20 times a week. Right. And I don't, I don't take things so personally. I don't get quite so excitedly way too into everything at work where I, like I can easily get upset when someone's not doing something the way I want them to at work. Right. So this, yeah, feeling like that is a nice counterpoint. Thanks for humoring that little digression there. Uh, okay. So now demos, um, you're all here as solidus fans or at least professional solidus interest. So I worked as a, a Rails consultant for about six years for a series of agencies. And we did a lot of different demos. Sometimes we'll do like a end of sprint demo, like every week or two, you'll show you a team, like here's the new feature we built, here's how it works, here's why it's useful. Sometimes we'll do more of a product demo, which might be like a customer sales thing, or often for people who are more business stakeholders, people who are writing checks or own a business and not necessarily interested in programming. And then Another category I wanted to talk about was just general informational demos, which is something I've learned more about this last year. So let's see some tech demos. So things to think about there is fundamentally, we are paid to program because programming tasks are unique. Like if somebody wanted me to do something that did not require critical thinking or exploration, then I could just run the one line of command off of Google to do the thing, like say Rails new does not require a consultant if you have enough uh, programming knowledge, but doing specific things on top of a solid store is gonna require unique thought and uh, work every time, right? So that can get you really excited and uh, thinking about the technical details, but it can also be hard to remember to make time to prepare a real demo. Like my biggest problem with these every two week sprint demos is I would be grinding out new features and new code nonstop right up until the time the demo started. I mean, part of that's just my personality, but at least I'm aware of the downside. So I'd, I'd, I'd have a negative uh, feedback loop where I'd work really hard to demo something, to create something to demo, then I'd show up completely unprepared because I hadn't even thought about the demo itself because I've been building more stuff. So I kind of decided that, uh, a personal rule of thumb that I try to hold myself to and rarely do is to not demo anything that I didn't finish more than 24 hours ago. Like it's better to draw a line in the sand. So we're going to build until this point, And then we're going to take the remaining time before the big deal demo to actually think about what we're going to say, who we're showing it to, what we want them to see and understand about it. Like what are our desired outcomes? Third point here on hacker and talker, uh, this summer, I did a two-month intensive project for a defense client with a teammate, and we got stuck in this weird cycle of monthly uh, big high-pressure demos. We'd be grinding out all kinds of new code and features and whole programs and systems, and then trying to show all of it to these military brass in like 20 minutes on a, uh, what do you call it, a Microsoft Teams video call. And that was really stressful. And we did sort of do the same thing. We were grinding, getting more stuff done after the last minute. And I was able to, def to split responsibilities with the teammate. Like I'm going to be on the computer running through all the scripted programming tasks to show the things like here's these five programs and these dashboards, et cetera. And she's going to maintain a bit more detached perspective and like talk to the, the less technical uh, military folks on the call to make sure that we don't just completely go off the deep end. Like here, I'm both the providing the content and trying to manage the, the flow, which I do a lot better when I have somebody to lean on to do one or the other, right? So if you have the opportunity, you should uh, should do that. Actually, she and I submitted a, a PyCon talk and it might wind up being the same thing if it gets accepted, but it's really nice to have two people. If you, if you really get into the technical parts, then having somebody to, keep things on track is great. Uh, so yeah, two different types of scripting. In that particular demo, we wanted the customer to see these four or five specific things. So we had a, a Google doc that explained 
like the run of show, like we're going to do this, do that, do that. Like imagine a program at a, a play, like act one, act two, act three, that sort of thing. Like we had that. So we made sure to hit our points on the way through, but we also scripted everything. Like we are running, I don't know, a dozen or two dozen different command line invocations of various Python and Go and other programs and trailing, tailing logs and all kinds of stuff. So as we built up the demo, we wound up building like a whole separate Git repo with make files and shell scripts and stuff to track every little line item we want to demonstrate. So that is something that helps me a lot. I know I mentioned earlier that I have a terrible short-term memory. So again, I don't trust myself to remember the, the syntax to, to run the four or five things I want to show you all after this. So that helps a ton. Uh, you always want to have some sort of visuals uh, backed up in case you have demo trouble, like maybe you got Wi-Fi problems or the code's changed and you didn't manage to get the stuff fully automated. Uh, and that is a benefit to having the, the code in a script so you can at least talk about what you wanted to show. So like right here, what I'm demonstrating, what I'm showing all is uh, a markdown. Yeah, a markdown file that's on GitHub that represents the demo, but also let's say if I want to demonstrate, here's a solidus demo. Later, I'm going to show you all something. I mentioned that Docker being slow is a pet peeve of mine. So I set up a, a script to build a Rails image. It's like from Docker or uses the default Ruby image, does installs Rails, and then that's like a, a cached baseline. And then I have a separate one that's from a, an Ubuntu container that already has Rails installed, run Rails new and Solidus or Rails generate Solidus install all of that, just so I could time it and show you the difference. Um, so it's cool to have this. If the demo just totally fails, you can at least see that and it'll give me some things to talk about, but also I have the results sort of standing by. Uh, so here's Pollard. That's my big fancy new Linux box I built uh, a few months ago, running the, the build and install or from, a, from that baseline run Rails new and then uh, bundle install or bundle add whatever Solidus and runs the the generator that takes a minute 42 using this uh, uh, open telemetry CLI tool that exports metrics to a remote server. So here's the same thing running on my MacBook. Uh, it was four minutes and 34 seconds. Now I can actually show you all some of that in the background now that we're there. All right, so we're in the Solidus demo here, and we've got, uh, yeah, we've got mate time rebuild happening here on that machine. And now we're going to do the same thing on the Linux box. Going to log in to fish. So we're gonna build, we have this base image, which like I said, has Ubuntu and Ruby on it. Uh, we're doing uh, Rails new, which I just copied right off the Solidus getting started documentation. If anybody here works on Solidus directly, I should probably, I mean, I guess you probably would already know this stuff, but I noticed a couple of things that I had to, tweak like the the default Ruby image on Docker is 3.1, which has some sort of compatibility error. I dropped back to 3.0 and it was fine. Uh, I had the same thing with gem install Rails from the docs because 7.0 is out now, but the Solidus, the latest published Solidus version depends on action mail or something, six something. So put all that in there. But uh so that's all hard coded in here. Now we're 74 seconds in Rails new, whereas it only took 37 on the Linux side. And now it took me a while to remember how to 
make the rail tie stuff happen, but we're generating this and it'll be done in another 50 seconds or so, whereas this is gonna take four minutes total. So let's say we don't have time to actually watch that. Uh, we have wrapped it in this CLI tool that times the interaction and sends a metric off to any open telemetry service. So that would be like Gager here. And you can see what well, it knows about the metrics. I'm a big fan of Jaeger and Prometheus and metrics in general. You usually get more metrics if you integrate, you can put open telemetry directly into a Rails app with a, or a Ruby app with the gem, but I'm using the command line layer here because I didn't want to get too deep into building a four Rails project for this demo. So this is where it came from. This is the 434 from last time. I need to rearrange my screen a bit so I can see what's up. Yeah, winter mutes there in my local host, Pollard the remote one. So if I go up to, yeah, here's one that just, nope, that's two hours ago. So if we search it for fresh traces, here's one two minutes ago, it took a minute 58. And I'm guessing the Mac one's still going. So yeah, we at least know that it's gonna take two or three times as long on my MacBook. And this is a 2019 $2,000 machine that my company was proud to give me, right? And it's a good machine but I'm still basically using it as a glorified thin client to a homemade Linux box that costs less than half as much and gives you three times performance. So cool stuff to be able to do with a home office. Cutting it close on my self-imposed five minute timer there. So let's see if I can find where that presentation went. It's like I killed it, but that's okay. It's just a terminal app uh, I got another make task to kick off the, the slideshow thing because I just found this CLI markdown slideshow tool this morning and I would forget the syntax I think it's slide space presentation at MD but anyway uh, so now we are where were we we were at hotel so yeah you can, yeah, some quick things here. I want to hit notes on these. You can use uh, tools to annotate screenshots. Big help. I do this a lot when I'm trying to share things with people, like on Slack. If you can't actually show, show them your screen, it's a big help. And this would be great for anybody in a, a help desk context to wish that your users had the same tools. But if I wanted just to say, hey, how come this is five seconds? Like, it's nice to be able to copy and paste this into Slack, right? Uh, that's cool. There's a tool called uh, Ask Cinema, like ASCII Cinema, that lets you record whole screen sessions. So I could type in a series of commands and it records them as a text file and you can play back at will. You can go to askcinema.org, I think, to learn more about it. There's a, a tool that you can convert it to a GIF so I can take my screencast and then make it into a GIF and post it in Slack. That's super cool. Here's the simplest thing, just plain text logs in Markdown. That's coming from the, the basic uh, Markdown image rendering, not image, uh, plain text rendering, which I guess I can show you here. Like these are all just useful ways to add a little bit of extra detail to the things you're showing people so they can better understand what you want them to see, right? Oops. Yeah, so here's that. It's just wrapped in that. Like you can do this in your, your readme, but also works in a demo. We saw that visualizations are key for technical demos, but also for informational demos. I gotta speed up to show you both of those. Uh, so yeah, you saw the Solidus install demo, and it's nice to be able to show visuals to help people like just run into Rails news in two different terminals may not be super engaging or make the point really clear, but being able to see the rendered data helps a lot. Uh, so here's one that I like to do uh, just to show people, like let's say I built you a new website, like I'm Mr. Solidus contractor man, and I've just spun up a new Solidus app for you to look at on Heroku, right? So goofy stuff like this, you can make a, a QR code to, to open the site and then they can just fire it up 
by using, I think I used a tool called QR encode, but so here's the Solidus demo site, which I imagine you all have seen more than I have lately, but this is nice if you're just trying to make basically the same thing that I was just showing there, but actually make it more meaningful to a, a less technical and more business oriented stakeholder to be able to show stuff, not just like in my browser, which is the, the go-to, but it definitely makes a different type of experience to see it in an actual phone rather than just showing it zoomed in on the phone. Uh, and yeah, it's always important to try to get a feel for who is listening, what are, what are they hoping to learn from it? Like, what are they afraid of? What are they excited about? And help them to get what they want to out of your, your talk or your demo. Uh, this is a big one that I like, uh, super lo-fi wireframes. I forget the tool that does that, maybe Balsamic, but I'm sure you've all experienced the pain of showing somebody a UI that's not actually right up to anything on the back end, and they think that the program is done. And you're like, oh no, we've got six months of work left to actually build the thing. This is just the HTML, right? So super lo-fi wireframes help a ton when avoiding that. Um, informational demos for the last few minutes we got here. There are a couple of big, I guess, yeah, two big stories. The, the big uh, government demos I was working on this summer, uh, we were building integrations. We, we were a subcontractor for a huge prime contractor that's managing a, a giant government contract with lots of subcontractors. And most of what we had to do was building visualizations and a big data processing pipeline that directly integrated with like five or six different content processing APIs. Like let's say I've got a text file and I want to translate it to a different language or a wave file I want to detect the language and two speech to text. There we go. Gonna wrap that up quickly. So the thing is the the main contractors, they were providing our services that we integrate against, supposedly, but the specs they sent us were PDFs. And these they could have been like the things didn't quite work to spec. And I started feeling like I was losing my mind, nothing what I expected it to. Wound up having to build a lot of tests, but also ultimately built a ton of visualizations to show things like, I hit your API 10,000 times yesterday and 99% of them threw the same 500 code, right? Like it helps be able to give people those specific details in a way that's not really confrontational to help get through those problems. And that's, that's a big deal with any kind of subcontracting or just multiple technical organization situation. So here is sort of a, a local demo of a similar, but much smaller problem I have. My cable modem craps out all the time. Uh, so now I've found a, a tool that creates the cable modem, logs into it and gets stats on signal to noise ratio and various other modem health stats. So we actually had an outage earlier this week so it didn't come to this, but I kind of was worried it would uh, if I ever have to get on the phone with Mediacom for two hours to tell them, yes, I really do have a problem and yes, I need to fix it because I don't want really to change companies. It's nice to be able to just report this sort of thing. Like if you start reading off your numbers from your automated stats, people will generally just concede the point rather than saying, oh, no, it's definitely your problem. Have you tried rebooting it? So this is good. And it allows you to, to make the conversation more about what is going on what can we do about it together and not about like am i doing it wrong or who's falling down on the job so there we go i went a minute or two over my uh made up end time but that is everything i wanted to show and like i i warned thomas up front this is a a freewheeling demo that just shows all kinds of stuff that i like to think about with working from home and giving demos and just general remote work mm -hmm.